tonight. Amen. Lord, we come before you humbled, Lord Jesus, grateful, Lord God, that we can come into your presence, Lord, boldly before the throne of grace, Lord Jesus, understanding, God, that you're always there, that you never leave us, that you never forsake us, Lord God, that you're always open, Lord God, to spend time with us. We ask you, Lord, to have your way in this place tonight. Let your will be done. Help us to be sensitive to your direction. And everything that we do would glorify you in this place tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.
Exalt you in this place tonight, God. Name above every name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Be exalted. Be magnified. Hallelujah, Jesus.
Praise the Lord, everyone. Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord tonight? What a beautiful and magnificent presence of the Lord. Yes, let's clap our hands, everyone. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Make his praise glorious, glorious. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's a wonderful representation here tonight on a Sunday night. Great crowd of people that have come to the house of the Lord with open hearts and ready hearts. I was very, you know, I travel every week. I've uh, been doing it the last, well, basically all my ministry, even when I pastored, I traveled a lot, but um, I'm getting a lot of churches, and I, I just was very moved and very uh, impressed by the flow of the Spirit of the Lord, especially in the worship service uh, this morning, and that's a wonderful thing. Don't ever lose that, to be able to flow and be spontaneous, and then you bring it back again at the altar. You do the same thing and move into the flow of the Spirit. And that, that is such a tremendous quality uh, for a church because anyone from anywhere, from any background, religious background, can come into that atmosphere and recognize the Spirit of the Lord moving on the hearts of people and be drawn into that. So authentic, so real. What a blessing. Amen. I've been very blessed. It's my tremendous honor to be here and to be a part of uh, these services today. Thank you, Pastor, for inviting me and letting me come. Such wonderful hospitality. Uh, I'll be going tonight to Isaiah 59, and um, <clears throat> uh, I received quite a touch of God this morning. Um, I've been, because of my travels so much through all the years, and last year, 156,000 miles, and then uh, not only that, but, you know, you get a little older, and my sciatic nerve over here has just been acting up last night I struggled with it uh, had to sleep on the other side and during the last 10 15 minutes of the preaching today um, it was hurting so bad I was trying to be careful I was afraid it might give out and I'd fall over now I can just get up and preach on but it bothers everybody else you know, stuff's just happened to me. I've eat bugs. My contacts, when I used to wear contacts, have fallen out. I've broken my glasses in the middle of preaching. I mean, I, I just can go on, but it bothers the other people if the preacher starts falling down on the platform because of his hip, you know. <laughs> Man asked me one time, I was telling this big story about, about eight people that were blind getting healed in one single service in Pakistan. It's more than the entire book of the Acts of the Apostles. And he come up and asked me, he said, how can you tell stories like that and you're wearing glasses? I said, well, I said, that's easy. I didn't heal any of them. <laughs> I need a healing myself. I mean, my God, isn't it just like the Lord? Take, I'm blind in one eye, nearsighted in the other. Seen eight blind and people healed. I mean, obviously, I'm not doing these miracles, okay? I'm just needing some help. <laughs> Wish somebody would get some faith and pray for me. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. I said, look at Jesus. He's not wearing any. He's doing fine. <laughs> Praise God. But uh, so a lady came up around the altar today, and we were talking and greeting one another, and uh, I just perceived her faith and asked her if she'd pray for me. Well, she just prayed right there, and I got healed instantly sitting right there on that deal, and uh, it hasn't hurt all day. It's not hurting right now. Praise the Lord. Now, when we were going back there, because they, they saw me kind of struggling this morning to get up the steps, um, uh, uh, the pastor asked me, he said, do you want to take the elevator or the steps? I said, I'm healed. I'm not tempting God. Get me in that elevator. <laughs> Amen. I don't know if what I'm about to do is anywhere near in the stratosphere of what you were expecting from me tonight. Um, but... My wife and I are in the middle of a revolution in our lives and in our ministry. And uh, we've been married 33 years, ministering 32. And uh, my wife's always been an intercessory prayer warrior. But uh, with both my sons married now and gone from the home and in ministry themselves, uh, my wife has gone back to the earliest days of our ministry in her morning prayer time with God. And over, she started 60 five weeks ago it's been over a year 
a morning prayer meeting on the telephone conference call with three ladies. And she's now uh, on the phone, ministers' wives, evangelist wives, pastors' wives, several superintendents' wives, over 44 ladies every morning from 6 a.m. to 7, 12 states and three countries. And it's every day for an hour. And she's been doing this now for 65 weeks. And many of times you want the sermon, and I'm hoping there'll be an impartation tonight to bring a revolution. In this case, this sermon is a result of that revolution. And I want to bring an impartation to you tonight. And I have a lot to share, and I will be very conscious of the time. But if this happens to us, not if you hear what I'm saying, but if this happens to us tonight, um, th not only will this church be changed, your personal lives be changed, but, but more importantly, this community around here, your families, I'm preaching for many that are not even in this house tonight. Isaiah 59 and 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. And it gets worse from there. Uh, <laughs> All manner of lying and mischief and vanity and violence and destruction. And it just gets worse. So I'll save you all that. And we'll see the summary of the matter in verse 14. Judgment is turned away backward. Justice standeth afar off. Truth is fallen in the street. And equity cannot. It just, it's just bad and getting worse. Truth faileth. He that departs from evil maketh himself a prey. When you depart from evil and try to do right, you become a target. And the Lord saw it, and he dis it displeased him that there was no judgment. There's no discernment. There's no understanding. And you wonder, how could everything get here? And the final phrase, which is the message, gives explanation as to how things had gotten to such a condition. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. And so tonight, and I understand we're going to be partaking in communion, and I think right around the altar call moment is when I will call for that, right at the end of the ministry of the word. I think it's going to be right on time and right where we need to be. I want to speak to you tonight on recovering the ministry of intercession. Recovering the ministry of intercession. And this is for every person in this place tonight. The old seasoned saints and the brand new ones. Because everybody should be prayed for. Everybody ought to have somebody praying for them. And if you're here tonight in need of prayer, you're in among a group of people who care enough for you that we will take time and pray for you before you leave tonight if you need prayer. Would you give the Lord one last hand praise simply because he's deserving. And we're going to go deep into the word of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I will bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. I will bless your mighty name. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. God bless you. I have been very blessed in my 32 years of ministry. I fell into the hands of a good pastor. I was, I was telling Pastor Peters when I walked into the church for the first time in Frederick, Maryland. I'd been backslid from my youth, uh, backslid through my teen years. My hair was down to my shoulders. I was uh, heavily involved in drugs and rock music. And uh, first service I was at church, I went to the pastor's office and told him I was there because I was called to preach. <laughs> so y'all don't know what pastors go through. But I had a good, kind, understanding pastor. He said, that's great. We need more preachers. And he said, you won't be preaching next Sunday, but uh, I'm happy to work with you. <laughs> and he did. And I fell into the good hands of a pastor who helped me and trained me and, and got me going in the right direction. From there, I fell into the hands of the ministry of an apostle, Brother Billy Cole. Traveled with him for 17 years all over the world. I would guess at least 80 percent if not more of my ministry today and invitations and people that have had me come and then subsequently have me return is a direct result of meeting them through my association with brother Billy Cole he was known everywhere I have no heritage in the United Pentecostal Church uh, 
And so nobody knew who I was, but everybody knew who he was. And so I was very blessed. And through the years of travel and up till now, I've seen 879,000 people filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. I've been an eyewitness in one form, fashion, or the other of some modern example of every single miracle in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. In Papua New Guinea, I saw a physical, visible glory cloud. My wife was with me, and it was the first time with Brother Cole that he released me to speak the word of faith. And a physical glory cloud caught on camera, pictures, video, everything. People in the city could see it. They were trying to climb over the walls to get into the stadium where we were, come down and manifested just as I was speaking the word of faith. And then that night, 3,300 people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. 22 times more since then. I could go on and on tonight and tell you miracle after miracle, and maybe one day I'll get a chance to just come and tell you of some of the magnificent things that I've been so privileged to see. But for tonight, what I want to say, just on the tail end of all of that, there's really only one reason, one singular reason that I stand before you tonight and minister and that is because I have been privileged and blessed to have people that have prayed for me. My grandmother, who died when I was quite young, prayed for me, left words in a children's Bible that was given to me when I got older, prophesying of the ministry that I would have. My mother has prayed for me. I have a praying uncle who you will never know, who has prayed for me many times. My wife has prayed for me. Brother Cole told me, I pray for you every single day. There was a moment when I was out there far away from God, involved heavily in drugs and rock music. One night all by myself, very discouraged, very distraught, I came a hair's breadth from becoming demon-possessed. I was in the stupor and the intoxication of the drugs. The music was playing, summertime, I was alone. I could feel, I had I'd been to church. I mean, I'd received the Holy Ghost when I was seven. I was baptized at 12. I, I knew the spirit world, and I knew they were demons, and I knew they were there, and I was so discouraged that I, and hopeless, I just said, well, whatever. And I was willing to give myself over to it, knowing what it was. That's how close I came. At the moment I was about to give myself to it, there was a flash of light in that room, all three of the windows in that apartment that were up come slamming down at the same time. It frightened me so bad I jumped up, turned off the music, turned on the light. And that was when I prayed and called out to God. Whether well, You might have a hard time with this, but I prayed through that night. Amen. Right there, just a few moments from demon possession. I found out later talking to my uncle at the very hour, at the very time. He had got a heavy burden for me. <laughs> was calling my name in prayer. And if he had not been praying for me, I doubt I'd be standing here tonight. My wife and I have been through many trials of ministry. There have been times we've been disappointed and disillusioned. Things have not always worked out like we thought they would or should. We've been so discouraged at times that I didn't know if we would make it, what would happen to us. But we've made it through it all. She's always been an intercessory prayer warrior. And God has always made a way for us. I'm telling you, if you learn how to pray, and if you learn how to pray for someone, or if someone takes a burden to pray for you, it's an advantage unequal to anything else in life to have someone call your name in prayer. There's a similar text to the one I read in Isaiah. The Isaiah text is Old Testament, King James English, a little awkward. This one makes it really clear in Psalm 73, 1, 2, and 3. Psalm 73, this is of David. And David said, truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. David had become grieved, envious of sinners, confessing and lamenting his own backsliding. He had a terrible and negative attitude. How could we ever find ourselves in a situation as God's people called out of darkness 
into this marvelous light, envious of the prosperity of sinners. God help us if we get envious of their car in light of what God has done for us. Envious of their home in light of God saving us. We are the most blessed, privileged people. If you drove a jalopy onto this parking lot tonight, if the trumpet sounds, you're going to leave here. This world is not our home. We're just a passing through. Somebody said amen. amen. The secret to how you could find yourself in such a condition is found in the verse just before the one I read. If you go back to Psalm 72 and 20 and put 72, 20, it's the last verse of the last chapter. And it simply said, the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. That's how you get there, folks. How could it be possible that Christian people could have bad attitudes, could be carnally minded, could be envious of sinners, could let all these things creep into our lives? It's if we stop praying, that's how you get there. When David stopped praying, everything fell apart. Where there's no prayer, there's no power. Where there's no prayer, there's no miracles. Where there's no prayer, there's no favor. Come on, somebody. We can't. I have no magic formulas. This either comes down from heaven or it doesn't come at all. Where there's no prayer, there's no favor. No prayer, no joy. No prayer, no peace. No prayer, no answers. No prayer, no direction. No prayer, no fresh anointing. No prayer, no open doors. No prayer, no pathway of righteousness through the valley. If we're not praying, the promises go unfulfilled. The blessings remain unclaimed. Deliverance never arrives. And until we get serious and pray with a passionate heart, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous, we are simply closing our eyes, blowing out candles, and making a wish. Prayer is the force within the word of faith. Prayer is the incense in the worship service in every song. It's prayer that is the unction and the anointing on the preacher and on the singer. And without that unction, without that anointing of God, the most gifted among us in song, gift of the Spirit, oratory, or any other gift, we are simply sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. Which basically means no matter how gifted you are, you're just going to get on people's nerves. Back when we started doing praise, worship, praise singers and, and worship leaders, I ran a rotation of four of our praise and worship leaders. One of the gentlemen came to me and said, do you don't think I do a good job leading worship? I said, you do fine. I said, actually, you are our best voice and our best presentation. He said, well, why do you use me less than everybody else? I said, because the people don't like you. <laughs> and every time you go behind the pulpit, the spirit world shuts down. I said, you're very gifted and you're very talented, but you need to get some anointing on you and a burden for the people that you could bless the people. Why don't you stay a little later after the service today and shake some hands and give some people a smile and show the love of God. Because we need the love of God in our heart more than we need anything else. Prayer is the key that breaks the heavy chains of addiction. Prayer breaks depression. Prayer brings the brush of angels' wings. Prayer makes everything authentic and everything real. My wife has a little slogan. She says, pray about everything. You don't have to pray for hours. You don't have to pray for days. All you have to do is fulfill the scripture in all thy ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. You can breathe a prayer on your way to something and God will be in it. Amen. You don't have to go on for hours and hours. Just acknowledge, I need God in my job. I need God in my marriage. I need God in my finances. I need God in my education. I need to pray about everything. May it never be said of this wonderful church. May it never be said about any of us. As the Lord surveyed the condition, the lack of judgment, the lack of victory, he was ready to heal. He was ready to deliver. He was ready to set free. He was ready to hear their prayer and stretch forth his mighty hand. Only they weren't asking. They weren't requesting. They weren't petitioning. They weren't interceding. And we need to recover ourselves that it could never be said of this wonderful Parkway church that the prayers of Parkway ended. May it never be said the prayers of Doug Kleindienst ended. If they end, we end. We need this necessary ministry of intercessory prayer. 
And I'm using the word intercessory prayer, not just prayer, because it's significant and unique. Intercessory prayer is when you get in between. For instance, if you have a lost loved one, a lost husband, a lost wife, a lost son, daughter, grandchild, a niece, a, a nephew, a friend, and you get between them and the devil, and you stand in between, and they're over here. They're not praying. They're not asking. They're lost. They're enjoying their sinful condition, and the enemy's about to make sport of them. And you step and say, huh, you can't have them. In the name of Jesus, I pray for them. I bind you. I cast you back. I plead the blood over them. I'm standing in your way. That's what intercession does. Intercession prays the prayers they're not praying. Intercession asks for the help they're not asking for. Back in the old church, my sons laugh when I say that. We used to have people come up to the altar. I walk up to them and ask, how can I pray for you? And they would say something like, I'm standing in for my mother or I'm standing in for my son or daughter. I'm standing in. What they meant was, I'm not here for me. I have a prayer in my heart for someone I care deeply about. And I want you to pray right now for me like you were praying for them. That's what it means. They're not praying, so we're praying for them, on their behalf, in their stead. Are you all ready? I asked a pastor friend of mine. Uh, I'm a man of faith, but uh, sometimes uh, I have the gift of irritation. <laughs> I get irritated with stuff. And I see carnal people, ungodly people. I, see, I've been, I was taught apostolic principles and, and ways you approach God. The way you have to live, my pastor said, if you don't pray, you don't play. I was a drummer, not a good one, but you didn't have to be good in those days. We only had one beat. Well, actually, we had two, fast and slow. It was the same thing. I see people who are carnal, people who are not living right, people who have a terrible attitude. And then it seemed like they get blessing after blessing after blessing. And then they, they backslide and God forgives them and they try again and they backslide again and God forgives them again. You don't have to say amen, just listen as I talk. <laughs> amen. You know, I did get a revelation on that a while back. All these sermons about this is your last chance. One more time. If you walk out on God, he'll never call you again. I stopped believing that. Because it seems to me the devil will take them every time they leave church. I ain't never heard of the devil saying, that's it, I'm done with you. All you're going to do next revival is go pray through again, so just stay on in there. You're not even welcome out here in the world no more. That's your last chance. Either stay out of here or just go to church and be saved. I'm the devil don't do that. I have a hard time believing he's, he's more patient than the Lord is. If you're on your fifth time around, amen, come on, try one more time. Maybe this is the one you'll get it right. Come on, this is heaven or hell. Try again, try again, try again. Don't give up on your soul. Don't give up on anybody just because they've been around the block over and over and over. We may just get them saved 10 minutes before the rapture. So that ain't fair. You'll think it's fair if it's your son or daughter. I'm in a different mood here tonight. <laughs> so I asked my, my friend, I was a little frustrated, how these people getting so much mercy, so much grace, so much happening all the time. Doesn't seem fair, doesn't seem right. He astounded me with his, with his answer. He said, maybe not every time, but many times, Brother Klein, it's, it's simply because they have someone somewhere praying for them. Can I help you tonight? As we do what we should not do and compare ourselves among ourselves and we see the blessings some get and the opportunities some get, the next time you see somebody being blessed that doesn't look like they deserve it, realize there's probably a hidden part of that equation somewhere. And instead of thinking God's not being fair, what you might be witnessing is God answering the prayer of an intercessor somewhere that's saying, I know my son doesn't deserve it. I know my daughter's not worthy, but I'm just asking you, Lord, would you? have mercy on them would you give them grace one more time there are advantages you are able to release on people through prayer 
If my people, you know it, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people which are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. The way I read that verse of scripture, when it says, if my people call by my name, it looks to me like this thing's all up to us. He's not waiting on the world. He's waiting on us. He said, if my people get to praying, if my people get a burden, if my people humble themselves, if my people ask for it, I'm going to hear what they're asking for, and I'm going to answer their prayer. Hear me tonight. If you'll pray, God will answer. He's a prayer answering God. You should have shouted a little more on that. Because now i got to say this. If we're the only ones that can bring it, evidently we're the only ones that can hinder it. We're looking around at the world thinking, boy, we could have revival if it wasn't for the president. We could have revival if it wasn't for the Congress. We could have revival if it wasn't for the Supreme Court redefining and judging all these laws. Can I tell you tonight, Congress and the Supreme Court is not stopping the church from having revival. You can build a church at the gates of hell. The apostles built a church and founded the church in a very anti-Christian environment. They don't like us out there. They were feeding them to lions. Amen. They added a whole lot worse, and they did a whole lot better. We have just got to make up our mind. Heaven is waiting. Miracles are on hold. Vacant prayer rooms, silent saints are leaving us without a cloud in the sky, and it's the time of latter rain revival. I love you. I'm not trying to be unkind. My pastor taught me that uh, uh, strong, well, plain speech makes for clear speech. Plain speech, plain understanding. We're coming to the end of ourselves. We're running out of gimmicks. We're running out of substitutes. We're running out of cover-ups. Now, I'm on, I'm on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, and I got all the social stuff going on. I, that's all great and wonderful. Social media is not going to bring us revival. We, it can help. If we use it right, and quit airing all our business out there. Social media ought to be a testimony service. You ought to go in there and say, look what the Lord has done. Amen. <laughs> I better stay off of that because I got a lot of opinions on that right there. <laughs> Amen. I love all these beautiful lights they put up back here. Amen. They've changed the lighting in this place two or three times during service. I think that's beautiful. Got all these wonderful screens up here. I was in a church a couple weeks ago. They had a screen almost as big as this platform back here. I was calling it the Jumbotron. Amen. Yeah, the Megatron. It was everywhere. Amen. They had, I was in one church. They had so much smoke coming out, I thought it was on fire. I did. I'm not teasing. I, I actually was looking. I thought, oh, dear God, something's burning up up there. And then I realized the smoke machine was working overtime. I'm not preaching against that. I think if you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly. I mean, we got some money. Let's put up some screens and some lights, and let's do it. And the media personnel's doing an excellent job. Let's play these instruments. Let's make a joyful noise. I mean, let's put the branding out. Let's brand the parking lot and everything else and all the doors and windows, and you know where to go around here. It's beautiful. But hear me, folks, we, that's not going to bring revival. It just gives us a nice church to come to. We're running out of gimmicks. We're running out of everything else. What we need now is we are exhausting our creativity. Hey, I, I like to have fun. I'll be humorous in the pulpit. I use, I use props, and I always say if you have a weak sermon, you have to prop it up. Amen, I'm all for that. I think last time I was here, I brought the Ark of the Covenant down the center aisle. Had horn. I did that in one church. They blew that horn. They thought the rapture was taking place. <laughs> I'm for the drama, man. Bring it on. But we are running out of creativity. We're running out of our intellect. We're, we've done all we know to do. What we need now is we need God to reach his hand down to heaven and just touch us with the glory of his power. He said, this kind cometh forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. We've got to make up our mind, pastors, leaders, church people, if all we want is a pretty church with a good slogan and logo and proper branding and nice social media and put some nice rooms for our kids to go I thought I walked through the park coming here today walking down those aisles if that's all we want we're already there 
That's all going on. It's wonderful. Look at all that's happening right around here. That's an example of good leadership. That's an example of excellence. But Jesus said, the kind that cast out the devils, the kind that brings the miracles, the kind that breaks the chains, if you want that kind. See, we've got to decide what kind of church, what kind of atmosphere. I, I thank God for the beautiful songs, but when I come to church, I can listen to a song on the radio. I need to feel anointing. I need anointing that will break chains. Somebody come discouraged. They need the kind of power and exercise dominion over the demonic, the kind that sets captives free sitting in the seats, the kind that brings the Shekinah glory of God down upon the house of God where we start not just singing but saying we're standing on holy ground. There are angels all around. Come on, give the Lord some high praise all over the house. If this church, and I realize I only got to watch you this morning, but I'm a pretty quick study. I've been doing this a while. If this church gets to praying with the passion and the flow in the deep dimension that you worship, I feel sorry for the devil. I said, I feel sorry for the devil. I don't know when I've been among a people that had a deeper, authentic flow of God in an altar service and in the worship service than I was with you today. You could see it everywhere. And when you come to the altar, there it was. I'm telling you, when we get to pray until till we just lift our voices all over this place and the power of God flows in those dimensions, I'm telling you, there's not a devil that can be sent to this community that will be able to stop you. My wife says pray about everything. <laughs> I got both my sons are in the ministry. They're married to very wonderful young ladies. My wife calls them daughter in loves instead of daughter in laws. But let me tell you, that didn't happen by accident. Mama prayed for some, and she prayed some out. <laughs> my poor son had to go through three wake ups until he found one mama wouldn't pray out the door. We prayed for daughter-in-laws before we had daughter-in-laws. When my sons were growing up, I've never, uh, as I get older, I'm getting to become more of a morning person, but I never was. I've evangelized, stayed up late, got up uh, late in the morning, but my wife would get up. She's raised on a farm. She's up with the sun. She'd get them boys up and get them ready for school in their elementary days and bring them by my bed for prayer. I'd reach out there. I wouldn't even get my eyes open some mornings. Reach out there and find a head. Oh, Lord. Keep him safe from wrong, harm, sickness, and disease. Devil, I bind you in Jesus' name. I find the other head. I'd pray over him. Amen. It was a 30-second prayer. Amen. But them boys didn't leave our house and go off to a school without some prayer over them. I, I'm just going to tell you, if your kids go to public school, if you've got grandkids in public school, I'd pray over them before they left the house. If all you did was touch their head and say, in Jesus' name, drop them off, take an extra trip around the block, put angels around that school, plead the blood that some crazed lunatic doesn't walk in there with murder on his mind. Hey, you can cross your fingers and carry a rabbit's foot if you want, or you can engage in intercessory prayer. I'm going to give my kid an advantage. Many mornings they woke up with grease spots on their forehead where mama had been down there in the night anointing their forehead with anointing oil. She's anointed their blankets. She's anointed their pillows. She's anointed their clothes. She's way more spooky than I am. She tells me all the time, you're just not spooky enough. I did a three-day Gifts of the Spirit seminar in a church down in Louisiana. I was being all reasonable and practical and explaining how the gifts work. And that you don't have to be spooky to be spiritual. And, and you don't have to be weird to, to, to work in the Spirit. And she went back there with the ladies on the last night. She got to telling angel stories. They were laid out on the floor talking in tongues for hours. She said, I told you. The hurricane came through Florida last year. And uh, we were going to ride it out. I was ready to hunker down. And then I realized that if I started, if I got uh, stuck, I wouldn't be able to make my preaching engagements. 
which is very important in our household. And uh, so I decided we were going to go ahead and leave ahead of the hurricane. And uh, But my wife had gone out and put a handkerchief, uh, anointed handkerchief in the tree in front of the house. And we called our neighbors over to pray with us that the hurricane wouldn't destroy our homes. We had prayer in our living room in a circle. And the lady, the next door neighbor lady asked us, said, what's this white cloth out here in your tree? My wife said, that's anointed handkerchief. God will pass over our house. The hurricane won't damage anything. Man, she went home and put a handkerchief in her tree. I don't even think she understood what it was, but they got one, I need one. You can believe what you want. I think God just did it as a sign and a testimony to our neighbors. Hurricane came through. Electricity was out for 14 days across the street. The house you would, I could open my door. That house over there, no electricity. Our side of the street, we never lost a limb. I think God did it just as a testimony to the neighbor to show them. If you'll pray about it. Come on, folks. What would happen if you prayed about it? What if you pray about your situation, pray about your condition, pray about your financial trouble, pray about your marriage, pray about your family issues, pray about everything. We're praying right now over grandkids. We don't even have grandkids. One thing I'm praying is that I won't go insane because all the people I know, my friends, when they get grandkids, they lose their mind. I don't know if it's avoidable. They tell me you're going to lose your mind too. You can't pray against that. It just happens. Amen. We're praying over grandkids. We're praying, I'm praying, God, give them a soft heart. When they're born, Lord, God, let them be born with a soft heart towards you. As they grow, Lord, keep them protected from the evil in this world. I've been praying over grandkids I don't even have because they're going to show up one of these days. I'm not going to just cross my fingers and hope everything works out all right. I'm going to submit it to God that he can order our steps. If I die tomorrow and my grandkids are born next year, they'll know I've already been prayed for. I've done sent the prayers out there to meet them. Woo! When you don't know what to do, when we run out of lights and we run out of graphics and we run out of branding, the Bible says, Romans 8, 26, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit makes intercession with groanings that cannot be uttered. When we don't know what else to do, you pray in the Spirit. You let the Spirit start making intercession. When you've prayed everything you know to pray, when you've said everything you know to say, when you run out of love and run out of emotion and run out of tears and run out of it all, then you give yourself to the love of God and you let God pray through you because he loves them so dearly. Do you know why your number one concern in life should be the growth of this church? Not, it, it, it's not for the pastor. It's not for the bishop. Do you understand when this church grows, it's going to grow from people you know. They're not coming over here from California and Maine and Michigan. They're coming out of these neighborhoods out here. The people that are going to sit in these pews and get baptized next are going to be your family members and your friends. It's people you love. There'll be a few walk in off the streets that don't know nobody, but they're the exception to the rule. The churches grow from the people that you care about that are attached to you and that are affected by the people that are sitting in these pews. When these empty pews are filled, it's going to be one of your loved ones. Where's the baptistry at? Back here. The baptistry's back there. The waters are still tonight. But somebody's going to be next. I don't know who's next. Somebody's next. Whoever is next that steps down into that water, you may not know who they are, but they're going to matter to somebody. Somebody here, that's going to be a loved one. That's going to be a sister or a brother or a son, a daughter, a grandchild. That's going to be somebody that matters to them. Everybody that gets saved is going to be a loved one of this church. We ought to be pounding on the door of heaven. God, save our family, save our city, save our loved ones. Now, I'm going to be a little strong here, and I'm going to wrap up. Judgment of God can be withheld or even overturned through intercessory prayer. You think your loved one's too far gone, but they're not. I prayed for my brother for 30 years. Every time they put names on the screen, I'd call his name. 
I don't have time to tell his whole story. He was obnoxious. He's a military man. You couldn't talk to him about God. He ruined Thanksgiving, family dinners, and everything else. He was so obnoxious about church. Finally got his son prayed through. His son didn't even know what happened to him. He got the Holy Ghost, didn't even know what the Holy Ghost was. He finally prayed through, started putting on a clown outfit and bringing kids to church, handing out candy, running bus ministry. They started a daughter work downtown. Pastor sent him down there to help with that. He filled that up. Next thing you know, he met the district board, got a license, and tonight he's pastoring at United Pentecostal Church after 30 years of obnoxious behavior. <laughs> Miriam, the Bible says Miriam spoke against Moses. Because he married the Ethiopian woman, and, he, and she didn't like it. She had her reasons, but it made God mad when she spake against the man of God. Boy, we do it awful easily, don't we? We don't think it's nothing. I don't think pastor ought to do this. I don't think pastor ought to do that. I just don't feel like, well, I don't feel like, well. It's not as easy as it looks, folks. He could probably do a whole lot better if you'd quit criticizing and start praying for him. <laughs> Somebody said, that's right, preacher. You know, there is a difference between strong preaching and mean preaching. Modern generation doesn't know the difference. I came up under strong preaching. I'm not being mean. I know that's strong, but that's not mean. That's for your good. That's to help you. You should never have preacher preaching to you you didn't pray for. If I'm not doing a good job tonight, did you pray for me today? I know people know I'm prophetic, and I have a tendency to prophesy and speak words, and that's what they want me to do. But uh, much of the prophetic uh, demonstration is confirmation. And so, you know, you get up and you say something that God already told them. You prophesy something they'd already been reading in the Scripture. You speak something that the, the Lord had already revealed to them. It's pretty hard to confirm if there's nothing there to confirm. We like to talk about that fella got the Holy Ghost while Peter yet spake these words. But, you know, that just didn't happen by accident. <laughs> he was a praying man, a devout man, a giving man, gave alms always. He had been fasting under the ninth hour. An angel had showed up, told him to call for the apostle Peter, who had already had a vision. Listen to me. If I show up here to preach and y'all already been praying and fasting and seeing angels before I get here, you get the Holy Ghost while I'm preaching too. <laughs> oh, are we doing all right? I'm trying to revolutionize your thinking here tonight. I'm trying to, I'm trying to startle you out of apathy, startle you out of, out of making excuses and saying, I've got, I've got things I need from God, and I'm not going to sit around and hope they happen. I'm going to pray for them. God gave Miriam leprosy, and she was about to die. You can put Numbers 12, 13 on the screen. If it hadn't have been for Moses calling out to God on her behalf, in Numbers 12, 13, Moses cried unto the Lord and said, Heal her now, oh God, I beg you, I beseech you. You ought to understand, God's the one that gave her the leprosy. Because she was under judgment for her rebellion and her attitude. And now Moses is praying, God, I'm asking you don't do it. I'm begging you, Lord. Save her, Lord. And God listened to Moses' intercessory prayer. said, let her stay outside the camp seven days. But then she could come back in. And, Mo and Moses saved her life with his intercessory prayer. I wonder what would happen to us. If we stop praying the judgment of God on people and started praying the judgment of God off people. Y'all be glad when I get on the plane. I might be glad when I get on the plane myself. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm usually a pretty nice guy. <laughs> Preacher rocked my world a while back. He was talking about that prodigal son coming home and how the father ran off the porch to go meet the prodigal. So many ways, so many lessons in that. But he said... You have to ask yourself why the father was in such a hurry to get to that son. Of course, he was happy he was home. Of course, he was glad he was back. But he said, could it be that that father knew I've got to get to him before his brother does? Because if his brother gets to him, what are you doing here? 
you know what you said. You know what you did. You've made such a problem around here. You just need to go on down the road. But that wasn't the heart of the Father. I don't ever want to be the kind of person that God's got to protect people from. I better get to him before he does. I better get to him and love him before he gets to him and judges him. No, I'm not trying to preach your last chance. I'm trying to tell you God has so much love and so much mercy and so much grace. Come on, run into his arms one more time. Come and beg for his help one more time. You'll find out he's a loving God that wants to help everybody no matter what. If you have a son or a daughter or a grandchild or any other special loved one in your life that is embarrassing you, that is bringing a shame upon your family, if they're in prison, if they're immoral, if they're living in a terrible immoral lifestyle, if they are doing things that are just so shameful to your family, I understand that. But I am begging you tonight, just keep loving them. You don't have to agree with their actions and make excuses, but don't stop praying for them. Don't say good for them when something bad happens. Pray for them. Pray if you love them. I'm giving you permission to love them tonight. Just keep, if it was mine, I'd pray for them. <laughs> Old Charlie Mahaney used to pray for his boy Nick. Nick was in the world. Nick was in drugs. Nick gone to jail. Nick, Nick should have went to prison for 40 years. And, and Charlie was praying for him and requesting prayer everywhere and telling what he was in. A man walked up to Charlie Mahaney one time and said, I'll just tell you right now, if that was my boy, I wouldn't put up with that. If that was my boy, I'd just let him go to jail. He said, if it was your boy, I would too. But he's mine. Somebody's got to get a burden tonight. He says, but I love him. I love him. It's not wrong to love him. It's not wrong to love them. It doesn't diminish your righteousness to love somebody that's unrighteous. Do you know why Moses prayed for Miriam? Because she was his sister. I pastored. I had people that gave me fits. It just almost would have been better for everybody if they just would leave. But that wasn't Moses' attitude. He didn't want her to die. She was criticizing him. She was stirring up rebellion. She was causing nothing but division. But she was his sister, and he loved her, and he wanted her to be saved somehow. And this just is more than I can almost even wrap my brain around. But Stephen is being executed. He is being stoned. They are throwing stones, and they're going to keep throwing them until he dies in front of them. The stones are bouncing off his head. Blood is beginning to flow. He is in his final moments. And while he's being executed, he goes into intercessory prayer. He says, oh God, lay not this sin to their charge. He basically said, give them a free pass on this one. Don't judge them for this. Lord, just look at this like it didn't even happen. I'm going to be with you in a few minutes, and it's not going to matter to me anyhow. Lord, let them go. Don't judge them. And what's so profound, that's so noble, that's so honorable, but it's much more than that. There was a man standing there that day named Saul who was holding on to Stephen's coat and participating in the execution. And because Stephen said, God, you don't have to judge him you don't have to curse him God was able to call him and Saul became Paul and reached all of Asia and wrote most of the New Testament Bible you carry to church tonight and Stephen the intercessor in his dying prayer gave the church an apostle Paul and I just have to wonder who's in prison tonight that we get to praying for is going to be an end time evangelist or an end time missionary is going to come into this church and be such a soul winner that they're going to win your family to God. Our musicians and people could come to get in place to help me here in the closing moments. Abraham prayed for Ishmael who was born out of the will of God through his own lack of faith, but he prayed for him because he was his son. My wife's mother was a godly woman. She lived for the Lord, but her father, father, he was a dairy farmer. He was a good man. He was a good country man dairy farmer, but he wasn't a religious man. And he had, he had been a veteran. And when he got in his older years, he had uh, kidney cancer. And it got so bad in his system, they had to amputate his legs. He's up at the veterans hospital. 
And he said, tell them preachers don't come up here and pray for me. I don't want them up here bothering me. So we couldn't go up and pray for him. I mean, I could go because son-in-law, but preachers couldn't go. So my wife went to visit her father on his deathbed and took an intercessory prayer warrior from the Apostolic Lighthouse in Frederick, Maryland. Her name was Sister Duty. Now, Sister Duty, she tried to lead the choir for a while. She wasn't a real good choir leader. She wasn't a very good singer. She couldn't play any instruments. She wasn't very organized administratively. She couldn't really run any departments. But Sister Duty sure knew how to pray. You know, sometimes prayer warriors can't do much good anywhere else except talk to God. As a matter of fact, I had one lady in my church named Sister Kim. She's a powerful prayer warrior, but all she ever did was offend people at church. She was so critical because everybody else wasn't as spiritual as her, you know. Well, it got quiet. I think I found a problem. <laughs> Amen. Now, if I was overseas and I was in trouble, I'd have called Sister Kim. But I had to tell Sister Kim after prayer meeting one night, I said, Sister Kim, I love you. God loves you. I said, but will you please stop talking to people? Talk to God, no one else. Talk to me once in a while because I can only take you so much. The people can't take it all. God seems like he can handle it. She took Sister Duty with her up to visit her father. You know how these people are. Sister Duty gets down there in Mr. Windsor's face. Says, Mr. Windsor, wouldn't you like to pray and talk to God before you die? Mr. Windsor went like this. That was on for Sister Duty. That was a full-fledged confession right there. She went to praying. My wife was smart enough to know she probably ought to leave the room because her daddy wasn't going to probably open up with her standing in there. She went out for a little while. When she come back, Sister Duty had her hands up on her daddy's head. He's laying in that bed with his hands up talking in tongues. Sometimes an intercessor. Prayer can go anywhere God can go. Prayer can do anything God can do. They may not let us send preachers to some countries, but we can pray. God can send angels in there. Hallelujah. I preached her daddy's funeral. He didn't get healed. He didn't come out of the deathbed. He got a Bible, started witnessing. We found out later. Can you believe this, Henri, old fella? My wife's brother's a pastor. Started telling him, you got to get baptized in Jesus' name. He said, I'm going to tell you something I never even told your mother. He let his wife die without knowing that he had been baptized in Jesus' name in the military 30 years ago. He said, I got it. I know what you people are about. I guess that's why he was so against it for all them years. He knew what he was talking about. I preached her daddy's funeral. I entitled the message, Finishing Stronger Than You Started. I said, oh, oh, Mr. Windsor, he didn't start out so good. He didn't run too well. As a matter of fact, toward the end, they amputated his legs. He wasn't running at all. I said, here he is today in his final moments. He didn't, he didn't start well, but he finished well. And I talked about how he prayed through right at the end. And I stepped down there. His backslidden son was on the front row. I said, Lee, wouldn't you like to pray? <laughs> he went, I said, I prayed him through the Holy Ghost, standing one foot away from his daddy's casket, because I'm telling you there's power in intercessory prayer. I'm telling you prayer can turn the situation around. If we get to praying with all of our heart, stand with me across the house of God tonight. Now we're getting ready to go to the Lord's Supper. We're getting ready to go to the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I was thinking about this tonight, not related to what I wanted to preach in this message. And what hit me was, really, this is the heart of what intercessory prayer is. You can play a little softly over there and take the nervousness out of these people's hearts. I asked the Lord, I've been preaching this message around at churches. Sometimes people are wailing and praying and talking in tongues and getting into intercession. Sometimes they just wonder how long is he going to drone on with all this before he quits. And I started asking God, I said, God, how is it possible that people with lost loved ones could hear a message like this and not be moved to tears, not be moved with a burden? How is it possible that we don't have a burden for the lost people all around us? He said, son, you're dealing with two signs of the end times. One of them is men shall be lovers of their own selves. If you did this tonight, I apologize for what I'm about to say. The Lord loves you and forgives you. But the Lord showed me there's people listening to you preach a message like this, and they're saying, 
Oh, man. I wish he'd have preached on faith and prophesied tonight. I really have needs. <laughs> Men shall be lovers of their own selves. If we're not careful, we put our needs first every single time. And I'm not saying it's wrong to come to church. You should come to church and pray that your needs are met. But it's in order every once in a while, every now and then, to set your need aside for a moment and say just for a few moments, there's some people far worse off than me. And I'm going to take a few moments and pray for them. I mean, at least if you, you may be sick, you may have a disease, but at least you're on your way to heaven. There's somebody out there tonight like I was. I'm sure when my little uncle was praying for me, it wasn't because he didn't have any problems. But I'm so glad he prayed for me that night because I was, I was in an emergency. He sent an angel that kept me from becoming demon-possessed. I wonder who's out there tonight. Somebody in this surrounding community so close by. They're so desperate. They may have a bottle of pills in their hand. They may be getting ready to run their truck off a bridge. But in a few minutes, we're going to be praying. And God's going to deliver somebody because of the intercessory prayers of a church. Second thing the Lord told me was the love of many shall wax cold. Now, I, I think this will help us. I think we are so traumatized with bad news and with the stress of life and financial issues and family issues and career concerns and life is just, it's a pressure cooker that our emotions have become traumatized and we just, we just don't feel things as deeply maybe as a past generation. It's a sign of the hour we live in. So here's the answer to all that. When we know not what we should pray for as we ought, we pray in the Holy Ghost and the Spirit makes intercession for us. Because, listen to me tonight, if you're out of tears for your loved ones, when you pray everything you know to pray and you don't have nothing else to say, you remember this, Jesus loves them even more than you do. This blood and this, this, this juice and this cracker represents the shed blood and the broken body of Jesus Christ on Calvary. He did this while we were yet sinners. He died for us. So when we take this tonight, and while I'm talking, you do, do we start in the back or the front? Where do you? Come on up and get your, get your communion cup while I'm talking. Start, and we're going to all take it together. But when you take this bread and you take this cup, what I believe is going to happen tonight, there's going to be a, there's going to be a partaking, a partaking of the body of Christ, the love of Christ shed abroad in our heart. I pray that just as God so loved the world, that his love will come to us through this, which represents the stripes, the nails, the crown of thorns. Deep intercessory prayer where the love of God is flowing through us, where his burden is flowing through us. It'll set the captives free. Come on. As you're taking this tonight, say, tonight, God's going to give me a burden. Tonight, I'm going to feel the love he felt. I'm going to experience what he experienced. The love of God at Calvary's cross. The love of God at that old, that old rugged cross. Mercy there was great. Grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me at Calvary. At Calvary, he came down as close as he could get to mankind. And at Calvary, we reach as far for him as we can. He died for the sins of the whole world. He died for your prodigal son or daughter. He died for your wayward, rebellious son or daughter. He died for those that are on drugs. He died for those in immoral lifestyles. He died for those that are in prison. If you have a loved one in prison tonight, he died for the prisoners. 
He died for those that have done terrible, unimaginable, shameful, immoral things. He loved them so much. We need that to get in our hearts here tonight. As you're coming, and some are still coming down this left side, some of you may want to come over here. You can walk over there and double up. I want to tell you a very short vision that I had as a young preacher. I had a Bible, the one my grandmother gave me with the writings in it. It showed, showed Jesus there and the little boy, the boy that brought the five loaves and two fishes. And in a vision, I saw that. I'd been on a long fast. And I looked down over the hillside and I saw Jesus standing there with the loaves and the fish in his hand, bowed his head, blessed it, break it, gave it to the disciples. They started handing it out. And some of it floated up out of his hands where I was up on the hillside, floated the loaves and the fish right to my face and stopped and then moved off to the side and disappeared. The whole situation changed. Now it was nighttime. The crowd was gone. There was only a few of the disciples, the 12 that were with him. He's on a rock. He has the communion chalice in one hand, the bread in the other. He said, take eat. This is my body. This is my flesh. He said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. It came up out of his hand, came right up to my face and disappeared into my head. He said, I will give loaves and fishes to multitudes and send them away. But I'm asking you to partake of me. Through years of ministry, I've realized it didn't seem like a really good menu. It seemed like they got the good stuff. But he said, I gave them a meal. I give you me. That's what we're partaking of tonight. This is not just loaves and fishes. This is not just signs, wonders, and miracles, and blessings, and prosperity, and financial breakthroughs. Tonight we are partaking of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It's representative. That cracker you hold in your hand, that wafer, that is the body of Christ which was broken for us. The body which received the nails and the, the whipping post, the stripes. He said, I want you to eat my flesh. I want you to get my character. I want you to have a part of me and you. So why don't you partake of that tonight, realizing it's the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he said, I want you to take of my blood that was shed for you. And I want it to flow through your veins. And what we're going to do tonight is the burden. He shed his blood for our family. And as we partake of this tonight, Lord, I want the burden. I want the love that you have. I don't ever want to forget, and I don't want to ever give up on people that I hold dear to my heart. Partake of the blood of the Lamb. And now, I want us to come to this altar, but listen, I want you to get somebody on your heart, somebody on your mind. And I want you to walk down here and stand, kneel, come to one of these front seats and sit down. Whatever makes you comfortable. The musicians are going to play a, a song. And I want you to pray for someone that you love. Come on. I impart and release to you tonight the spirit of intercessory prayer. Call somebody's name. Is there anybody you love enough to pray for them? And we'll pray for one another in a few minutes. But with the hundreds of people that are in this room tonight, there are literally thousands of lives that could be changed, that could be altered. Somebody needs a prayer warrior. Somebody needs an intercessor. When you say all you know to say, pray in the Holy Ghost, speak in tongues, pray in the Spirit. Call names. They may not even answer the phone if you would call, but you can pray. Save them, oh God. Have mercy on them, oh Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, call their name. 
times. I love him, Lord. I love him, Lord. He's so great, could ever be. I love him, Lord. enough to call their name tonight in the house of God. Hundreds of names are being lifted up to the Lord. Hundreds of people are being prayed for. 